Hello. In this lecture on Roman art, we're going to look at the history of Roman art and culture. In uh, I'm going to divide it in two halves. So I'll do the first half, and then we'll come to another slide um, of uh, notes like this one, where you're going to want to pause the video and, and write down the slide uh, notes, and then we'll go on and do the second half. In the first half, we'll look at Roman Republican art, we'll look at Pompeii, we'll look at the early empire. Then in the second half, we'll look at the late empire and the transition to antiqu antiquity. Now, um, this is the point where you'd want to pause the video so you could re record these notes. I'll give you just a second. Okay, so as we transition from the Etruscan culture to the Roman culture, we, we notice a few things about how Roman art and culture is different than any other cultures that we've seen thus far. They, they saw themselves as the descendants of the Etruscans, which, as we talked about at the tail end of the Etruscan video, is uh, kind of ironic, seeing as how the Etruscans didn't see the, the Romans as worthy of joining the Etruscan League. But the, the key thing to remember, I think, with Roman art and Roman culture is that it's, it's difficult to underestimate how their system lent itself to taking the best parts of their influences, the best parts of the cultures around them, and incorporating it into their culture um, and making it Roman. They, they understood that it was better for Rome and it was better for Roman culture if they didn't focus on where the ideas came from. It really just mattered how good the ideas were and if they were good enough to be um, incorporated into Rome and made Roman, um, then it didn't matter where they came from. They would borrow them from other cultures, um, not just their ideas, but all parts of those cultures, and they would incorporate them into Rome. So as the, first the Roman Republic expands and spreads, and then the empire spreads, um, we see a lot of influences on Rome and things that, you know, will at first glance, don't necessarily seem Roman. They seem like they come from another culture because they do. Um, and so ultimately, that attitude of openness to influence from outside cultures and just borrowing from other cultures is what makes that transition into building the empire, uh, culturally anyway, um, a relatively smooth one. They, they, they don't feel like they um, are closing themselves off culturally to their neighbors, to other influences. And when a new group joins the empire, they are treated like they're part of Rome rather than uh, they being forced to change necessarily what they're doing to match some sort of you know, foreign view of culture. And, and that's really important because it allowed for Rome to take the best of the, of the parts of the empire, bring them back to Rome, and, and build this composite culture that uh, is very important to the way that, that they viewed themselves in their own cultural identity. So, Looking at this <clears throat> temple, at first glance, it would appear very, very similar and might even look like an exact copy of a Greek temple. Um, it has a significant amount of resemblance and a significant uh, similarity, and that, that's important. Uh, the columns are ionic columns. Uh, the form of the temple is very similar to what, what you would see in, in Greece or in Greek culture. But there are some changes. 
that you can then you know you can tell that mark it as more Roman than Greek. First is the use of the pedestal uh, in a slightly different way. So in a, a Greek temple, the the building, the structure would be built on a pedestal base that had three or four steps, and those steps would extend, uh, in most cases, at the very least on, on the two longitudinal ends, but, in, but more often than not, the pedestal base would surround all four sides of the temple. So you could access the temple pretty much from any point. Well, the Romans felt like that was impractical. Um, they wanted to use the steps as a, to clarify the entry point and to make the temple itself uh, easier to defend. The temple was a place where offerings were made, where taxes were paid. Uh, temples had a treasury. Temples had uh, you know, a collection of money, and uh, as such, it was important that we, the, they keep the temple safe. The Romans actually also, as they brought more uh, cities into their territory, into the, the Republic and into the Empire, they used the temples that they built in those cities uh, as a place to collect uh, the taxes that were going to be paid um, and so it, it just meant that the, the treasury at the temple was very important. In fact, the Romans established guards for their temples. So that there's a, a temple guard for the first time. And that, that really is, uh, you know, sig connects to their um, insistence on pragmatism. The Romans are a very pragmatic people. They, they see culture as important, but it has to be functional. It has to work in support of the society, or it's not meeting its full potential. So it looks like a Greek temple because the Greek temple was considered by everyone to be, uh, everyone in the Western world pretty much, to be a beautiful structure, an iconic structure, a classic structure. So instead of creating something new, they just borrowed from the Greeks. Um, they borrowed many of their gods. They gave them Greek name or Roman names from the Greek originals. Uh, they borrowed the myths and legends. They just brought it in and made it Roman. Now, um, there are some other differences besides the stairs. The proportions are slightly different. The walls of the cella, the interior structure, are pushed all the way to the edges. The they, walls go in between the columns. The columns are still there as a, a kind of a structural and decorative element and to, to remind you of that Greek temple original. But to maximize the interior space, they pushed the walls all the way to the edges. It also makes it easier to defend. It doesn't have access points and openings anywhere but the front. Um, they remove and simplify some of the decorative elements. There's no pediment sculpture. There's no sculpture on the roof line. There's, um, it's, it's a simpler version of the original, but again, more practical, more pragmatic. Now, we saw in the Etruscan culture at the end of it, we saw the incorporation of the, the figure of the orator. And we talked about how that was the first politician and the orator was trying to convince the, the people of Etruria to follow based upon the power of the ideas. Well, initially in the Republic, we see a lot of influence from that, that we see, you know, the idea that as the leader, that you need to create a consensus, that you need to create support for your plans and for your ideas. Um, but in true Roman pragmatic fashion, if that fails and it does require the, uh, the leader to take up arms, then they need to be ready to do that. And so what you see here is the orator and at his feet are is his breastplate and armor. This is, so what that shows is his, the message it's supposed to communicate is that he's trying to convince the believer or not, well, the, the follower 
um, his fellow Republic member that the best way to do things is to follow his plan. But if that doesn't work, then he's willing to take up arms to uh, force his will upon the, you know, upon his enemy. And I think that, that, uh, you know, that's an important part of Roman culture. The Romans believed that they, and expressed themselves culturally, that images had power to send messages, that images as propaganda, sculpture and architecture, everything uh, had a, a purpose, that it communicated strength, it communicated authority. And so everywhere they went, they took these objects with them. It's said of Rome that, you know, Rome builds Rome everywhere it goes. And so now maybe in slightly different forms and a slightly different way and reflective of local culture, but it's a, a different approach from what we saw in Greece or in Persia. The, the goal is not necessarily to solely build up the home city, but it's also to build up its, it, its uh, you know, member states as well. So they built temples, they built aqueducts, they built theaters and arenas, they built um, all of these Roman things everywhere they went. So every time a, a new city became part of Rome, it would share in that, in those public building projects. So being a part of Rome was definitely better than being its adversary. Now, in Roman sculpture, there's a concept um, in the Republican sculpture known as verism that's very important. Verism is their version of truth. Now, we've talked a lot about truth uh, as in the ancient world and how it would affect classicism. Um, and what really is true as a term in relationship to culture? Um, how do you how do you pursue beauty? How do you pursue perfection? Is that is that even possible? And where do you find it? Well, again, this is where Roman pragmatism comes in. Their idea about truth is that it was relative, and that truth uh, was found in a message more so than found in the accuracy of details. So as long as the viewer gets the message that the artist or that the patron is intending with the sculpture or the, the work, then, then that sculpture could be seen as true. It's veristic. Okay. Now, how do you do that is you show details and communicate things that match your message. That's more important than actual physical accuracy when it comes to sculpture or more important than what we would consider physical beauty. So this is an example of a bust portrait which became popular and common during the um, uh, early Republican period. And um, portraits like these were made to celebrate and commemorate uh, the patriarch of a family. The Romans were a very patriarchal society. So the, there, in every generation, there was a male figure, usually the oldest or firstborn of a male in a family would be the patriarch of that family. And that person would inherit the home, the business, the, the money. They would inherit everything from their father, and it would pass down generation to to generation to stay within a family and to build up that family's wealth and prestige. So these patriarchs became very important figures. Now, it would seem, you know, that it would be good to be that patriarch, and it was, but it was also um, a very important responsibility. They, these, these patriarchs had the responsibility of every member of their family, of their generation, of the previous generation, of the next generation of their family, was their responsibility. So, yes, they inherited the home and the wealth, but it wasn't theirs to spend or squander. It was there to maintain and invest in the family, and it was important that they understood um, what their responsibilities were. So, 
portraits like these were made to commemorate these patriarchs and they would have been placed in the family home um, and there would have been it, it was kind of a way for each generation to remember the the responsibility and to remember that everything that they had received was because of the hard work and effort of the generations that had come before. So when we see this, a figure like this, what we notice is that um, we see the scars, we see the signs of age, the lines and wrinkles, we see the, the pose and the expression, which doesn't seem very uh, friendly or warm or caring, because the point of the sculpture is not to show how happy this man was in life or to show how uh, you know beautiful or charming or handsome or whatever he might have been. The point of the sculpture is to remind every time the new patriarchs, every time the members of that family, they walk through that home and they see this sculpture, they'll be reminded that they, that their life and their wealth and their success and their, you know, um, all, all that they have is the result of their ancestors, of the people who had come before. So it's, it's in one way to celebrate and commemorate because it would have been made late in the life of this man. Um, but it, in another way, it's also a pretty stark reminder that of what's important, that you have to concentrate on building and your responsibility as the new patriarch is to build upon what had come before, not just simply to enjoy the wealth of, you know, generated by your father and grandfather. Now, it's carved in marble, which is actually kind of rare. The, the Romans preferred uh, casting in bronze, um, but they did carve in marble. And what's interesting about that is that it, because it didn't really come... Uh, at come, it wasn't part of their original culture. They brought carvers of marble from Greece, from what had been Persia, from other Hellenistic cities, uh, and they brought them to Rome, and they worked there, and then they taught other Roman sculptors to work in marble and to, to use the techniques um, that they had developed in their own cultures and make them Roman. So... Even, you know, the, even a technique that wasn't common at one point could become common if, you know, the, the, or as these new members of the Roman Republic and then ultimately the Roman Empire, as they become part of that group. Now, in the first century CE, there was a devastating uh, volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed a city a Roman city that um, in between Vesuvius and Rome, and it it actually dis, um, destroyed the city, but it also in a weird way preserved it. So Vesuvius is the kind of volcano that when it erupts, um, it tends to the damage from the volcano tends to be more in the form of ash and in falling ash because it's more explosive than it does to be in lava. Not that there wasn't a lava event, but it, was a, it wasn't a major lava event. It was more of an explosive and then falling ash event. And the ash of a volcano can be, well, first of all, it's very toxic, and second, it can happen so quickly because there's such an explosive nature to it that um, at Pompeii, these the people were uh, many of them were frozen and buried in ash in a matter of minutes now um pompeii was we believe to be a city of between 70 and 80 thousand people um which by their standards would have been a relatively small city but um you know it it was not a, it wasn't a village, you know, it was a city. It had all the elements of a city. And because it was on the sea, it had, or near the sea, it had um, certain elements. It had a certain more cosmopolitan feel to it than perhaps other cities of its size uh, farther inland. Now, this is the arena from Pompeii. 
as the work on the excavation of Pompeii over the last century has happened, what we've discovered is how they used public building to create the culture within their cities. So arenas like this didn't really belong to anyone. They belonged to the city, but they were a big part of Roman culture. Um, they, the, the Romans used the arena for sport uh, and for larger political gatherings, larger uh, social gatherings, uh, important events. Um, and, but most importantly, they would have been used for the games. Now, Roman games were a little bit different than what we think of. You know, they're not they're not playing football or soccer there. Uh, the games were usually what's referred to as blood sport. Somebody died. Um, the Romans didn't view life and death in the same way that um, other cultures or that we do. They they saw death as a part of life, and that um, as such, it wasn't necessarily something. Uh, distasteful. Um, it was, you know, th they their attitude was that at, since everyone's going to die eventually, um, it's more how you live. You find honor and glory in your living, and not necessarily in, um, you know, and how you die doesn't matter as much as how you live. Um, so the games were definitely bloody. Uh, and gory. Um, some of them were about battle, like we've seen the movies of the gladiators and the combat. Um, but uh, there was also um, the uh, the death and mutilation of slaves and of prisoners, um, and to uh, you know the the use of exotic animals. Um, all of that was a part of the entertainment within the arena. Now, the arena at Pompeii has, um, we see a suggestion of what it, you know, originally looked like. That there wouldn't have been those grassy areas. It would have been concrete and stone steps and seating benches all the way around, all the way up to the top. Um, the floor of the arena probably had a bed of sand, um, and even perhaps underneath it, uh, a wooden floor that would have allowed for trap doors and for um, the, the workings of the games. The structure itself was designed so that everyone in attendance, and this could seat about a fifth or so of the population of the city, about between twelve to 15,000, depending upon how it was configured and how many they crammed in, could be there to see the games. And um, it was a big part of their society. Pe people came to see the games um, so that they could, you know, for, for a, a, a sense of entertainment. In the same way that the Greeks favored theater, the Romans favored the games. Now, one of the most important um, dis discoveries and important elements of what we've learned at Pompeii is about the villas there. The villas were the, the city homes, the urban homes of the, the relatively affluent. These are the middle class uh, and, and upper middle class families in uh, in Roman society, these are not the lowest of the classes. We'll see what their homes look like. Um, these, but these are those patriarchs that I was talking about. And this is a plan of what a typical Roman villa might look like. Um, that area, that rectangular area on the left, is the atrium. It's open to the sky, and in this area in here, there's a a uh, garden usually with cisterns to capture rainwater and and there's uh, there'll be plants both for uh, garden and home use and there'll be small fruit trees perhaps and vegetables and then flowers and things to make it beautiful um, but all of that is inside the home it's open to the air and the, there's 
uh, it's open on the interior walls, but it's it is inside. It's not um, it's not outside the home. They brought the outdoors indoors. Now, um, this uh, this is really interesting practice because you think about in urban centers, we don't usually think about having a lot of outdoor space, terraces and balconies, that sort of thing. The Romans uh, invented all that, basically. Um, the rest of this area is the living area with storage, with um, a, the cooking area, indoor bathrooms. There's uh, probably rooms for uh, the patriarch for sleeping, but, um, you know, most of the living would have been done in these open air spaces. So this is a, you get a sense of the the atria and what it looked like. Um, and, you know, most of the, the climate there is, is temperate. It's, uh, or, or subtropical really. It's warm a lot. Um, it does rain a fair amount, but not, um, it's, it's not like farther to the North in Europe where it rains a lot. This is, they do get some rain, but, uh, it was worth it for, uh, you know, for it to be airy and open, the rest of the time uh, to accept a little rain. Um, plus, they use the rain. The rainwater is captured in the cisterns and allows them to water the, the plants and to use for household use. So this is inside the home. And it, they decorated their homes with sculpture, as you can see in the atria, and, and with frescoes all throughout the home. So uh, as you move through the home, you'll see the walls were covered with frescoes, which is paintings made on wet plaster uh, that are part of the wall. The, the themes and subjects of the frescoes varied from portraits of family members to allegorical figures to mythological figures to what we would call um, sort of the, the everyday mundane day-to-day -day life of the family and that's usually referred to as a, a, a subject matter as something very domestic or, or um, you know based upon the the life of the family that lives there and the figures represent the people the members of that family so you know each generation might add uh, a fresco to the to the uh, walls to connect to their family, their generation, um, but as it's passed down and passed down and passed down, it becomes the walls and the, the building itself become a record of the ownership of the family. Now, these frescoes are some of the most uh, remarkable found in Pompeii. They come from a villa called the House of the Veti, and the Veti were a uh, what's what is usually referred to as a nouveau riche family. They had uh, just a few generations before, maybe two generations or so before um, the destruction of the city, uh, the uh, and um, the eruption of Vesuvius. The this uh, villa was built and by the Vedi, and it was decorated, and the frescoes. Uh, reflect the most contemporary style and, and everything that they knew about technique uh, from that time period. So this isn't these aren't people who have had money for hundreds of years in the family at this point. Every every bit of their money came from the pre from just these two generations. But it's the uh, the lavish nature of the frescoes that's really remarkable. Um, and what they depict is sort of a typical, or they're supposed to depict, is a typical feast, a typical family gathering. Um, you know, the old and young and the gathering together to feast and to enjoy time as a family. Um, but you'll notice that they're they're dec um, they're wearing the clothes they're wearing and the um, and how they dress and how they look. All of that is it seems to pretty be pretty fashionable for the day. Um, they, they are uh, trying to show off their wealth, and that's what's important. You know, it becomes 
a status. Your villa was your status. And so you wanted your villa to have the best mosaics and tile work, to have the best frescoes, to have the best everything. It's interesting, in the subject matter, we often see sort of, or sometimes see, a mixture of myths and legends and various influences. So here we have uh, the kind of a Greek figure, or several Greek figures actually, um, but we think that the, that the paintings themselves are actually portraits of family members. So, you know, choosing that, you know, that family member to represent one of those figures. Now, as the Roman Republican period comes to an end, right around the turn of the, the Common Era, um, there's a, a, an interesting development culturally in, uh, in the empire, uh, well, what will become the empire. The, the Republic had been very successful in establishing the practices, the Roman practices, um, and spreading those throughout what today would be Italy and the territories that the Ro Roman Republic was able to conquer. Um, but it wasn't until the establishment of Augustus as Caesar um, where we see the first um, intense efforts the, in that first century common era to spread Roman republicanism into uh, what would become this vast empire that's, that spanned most of Europe. Um, but initially, the republic was, it, and the empire worked very much the same way, it was just how the republic spread. The, initially, the republic spread based upon these kind of egalitarian democr uh, democratic ideals of bringing culture to the people. So when uh, the, the Romans decided to expand and to bring a, a city or an area or region into the Republic, um, it was usually not necessarily by force, it was more by, um, by po politicking, by treaty, by a joint decision. And so those people th that lived, those citizens of that territory would then become Roman citizens. And as such, they would receive the same rights and treatment as Roman citizens of Rome. So the, you know, the decisions were made that if, you know, if a new city came in to be part of Rome, that they would get the same buildings, the same public works, the same rights, the same responsibilities as being a Roman anywhere in the world. And so as such, when we go to places like Paris, it's interesting that we see Roman buildings because pe people don't tend to think about the Roman Empire and its effect on Europe, uh, especially areas that seem so far away from Rome itself. But this is in Paris. This is a Roman temple. Paris was at one point. All of Brittany, all of Saxony, all of Normandy, all of, uh, of Germania, which is Germany and Austria – um, much of Spain and the Gallic territories, the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, and the like, all of that was at one point part of the empire. And so when you travel around those places, you see evidence of Roman influence everywhere. You see Roman buildings and Roman walls and Roman roads and Roman bridges and Roman aqueducts. And, and it's remarkable because... To, to think that these people were able to spread this culture so far by, by taking that culture to those people. And what, so, you know, when, when France becomes part of Rome, they take Rome to France. But you'll notice there's some differences here because now we're in the Republican period. The columns are Corinthian. Um, the building itself, the proportions of the building are slightly different. Romans tended to favor height 
over you know perfect proportion. Um, but the same basic structure as we saw with the previous temple, um, the Temple of Portunus, this is the Maison Carré, and we see here at work in this uh, you know, early Republican temple. Now, as the empire, as we transition into the empire, what we see is <clears throat> the pragmatic nature of Roman culture spreading and, and the necessity of that pragmatism spreading throughout the empire. So here is the Pont de Garde, the, the um, aqueduct, the Roman aqueduct. Um, there were dozens of these. Now, this is by far the largest and most elaborate, but there were dozens of these all over uh, Europe built by the Romans. And the sole purpose of this structure is to move water. It's been used as a bridge, as a footbridge, and you know, try and drive cars and stuff. But basically, the, the, the whole point of this structure is to move water. Now, what the Romans understood better, perhaps, than any other culture of the ancient world is that in order for a system of government that's going to be spread out, that's going to be divided, that's going to have different cultural groups and different ethnicities and different attitudes in order for that to function the way that the central government of Rome needed it to function, that it was going to have, they were going to have to make sure that the people had the fundamental necessities to make their lives livable, that you needed water, that you needed food, obviously, that you needed shelter, that you needed to have the possibility of a good life based upon the the quality of your living it. Um, that, you know, you, you can't expect people to give their all towards the central government if the central government never gives anything back to the people. And so, and just from a, a realistic logistic standpoint of, of the way that your army and your society works, if you run short of water, Right? If you run short of the basics of human life, food and water and shelter, then you're not going to feel much like fighting. You're not going to be able to fight. You're not going to be able to go off and you know, go on these campaigns to, to defeat and expand Roman territory. Now, so the whole point of a, a system like this, of bringing water where it's needed, is to provide for your people. Um, it is, it's pragmatic, it's practical, but it's also um, works out as a propaganda message. When you build something like this, it sends the message to your people as Roman citizens that it's good to be Roman, but also to others. They see this and they, you know, then they think about, well, we don't have that. You know, we have to go to the well or dig the well, or we have to go to the river to get the water. The water doesn't come to us. But you know, in Roman culture, they used what they learned about engineering. They used what they learned about gravity and hydrodynamics and science to figure out that they could possibly, uh, it was possible, and they could bring the water to them, that they could make the lives of the people, the lives of the people in the city more livable, better, make them more comfortable, make them more functional, and then that would in turn encourage them to want more and to support the central government more. Now, the other propaganda message of the early empire is the, the use of what are known as triumphant arches. So this is the first, uh, well, not first, but this is the, the first, uh, an early version of what we would think of as a, a Roman monument. Now, there have been lots of monuments built before the Romans. You know, the, the pyramids, the Sphinx, the uh, Abu Simbel, and all these funerary monuments. Those are very, very large and important and culturally important and influential. But the difference between that type of structure and this is that that those were built to the glory of individuals to commemorate a person. In theory... 
uh, sculpture and statues like these, or structures like these, were intended to be built to the glory of Rome, and the victories of the Roman legion and army led by an individual. So it might be called the Arch of Tiberius, or the Arch of Constantine, or the Arch of whoever the emperor was, but on it, there's references to the glory and greatness of everyone involved, down to the last soldier that they cared about all who gave glory and, and brought glory to Rome. Now, the structure itself, with the archways and entryways, is supposed to kind of commemorate and remind and remember um, the passage. You know, arch is a gate, and so this is about the passage of time. It's about the opening of the that region. So an arch like this would be, built to commemorate um, the campaign led by the emperor to bring that territory under the authority of Rome. And so, and every year on the, on the anniversary of the battles, the armies would march through the gate and they would celebrate. And that was a big part of what this was about. It was this symbolic gesture, this propaganda message that Rome is great and glorified, and you don't want to mess with us. Now, in the early empire, it's the first five emperors are usually considered to be the best. The, they in the, basically span the years, the, just uh, the first 125 or so, 150 years of the Roman Empire. Uh, and into the Common Era. The first of those emperors, uh, Augustus, is usually considered to be uh, the, the best general, but not necessarily the wealthiest because of his successes and the successes of the emperors who came later. He, he didn't uh, rule over as much territory as his successors would. Now, this is called the Arapakis, the Altar of Peace. And it is incredibly ironic that the Altar of Peace would have been built by Caesar, uh, by um, Augustus, because he was one of the most bloodthirsty generals and the most uh, successful generals in terms of military campaigns uh, ever in the history of the world. Uh, and so as such that he builds the Altar of Peace, it's not... Um, it's it's about not about the the peace that he enjoyed. It's more about the fact that his campaigns led to an era of peace for Rome. Now Augustus, this is called the Augustus of Prima Porta, and Augustus used art as a propaganda message. Um, in a, a very unique and important way. He wanted the people to understand the people of Rome and the people who were Roman, um, who, their, who were their enemies, but also those people who were made perhaps reluctant um, parts of the actual empire. He wanted them to understand that Roman authority was absolute. That once, uh, you know, in their minds, and in, in Augustus's mind for sure, but um, he wanted he wanted to make sure that, that they understood that there was no challenging Rome, and so Rome was able to rule over a vast empire, and that empire expanded exponentially very very quickly. But it was able to do that because of its logistics, and because of its organization, and because that they understood that symbolic messages of authority were often enough to curtail revolt and dissent. So in this, here we have the kind of culmination of the last of the orator images. He's wearing the armor, and on his breastplate there's a symbol of his divine authority, that he's blessed and sent from the gods to lead, and he's ready to speak as the politician, but he's also ready to fight as the general. Now, 
what we see here is how Hellenism, because by the time of the empire, right, Hellenism is, has for the last couple of centuries been Greek art and culture. How Hellenism finds its expression and Hellenistic style finds its expression in Rome. Okay, so the Greek market woman on the left and the Roman market woman on the right. The Greek market woman is old and bent, but very realistic and very true. The Roman is a mother of a young child. She's she seems upright and powerful and full of life. Um, and you know, this is sort of the difference between what we would see in Greece and what we'd see in Rome. Rome wants to tell their version of the truth. Rome wants to tell the, a story that fits the glory of Rome, and that's more important than reality. That, that they find beauty in everyday life, both do that, and both are looking for beauty, but they're, they're communicating that search differently. Now, I want to pause for just a second to allow you to pause the video and copy these notes and we'll start up in just a second okay so now as rome moves into the empire to the high empire which is usually from right around the you know the last 30 or so years of bce and into uh, the first century and the second century of the common era um the goal of art and culture in in Roman society changes. There is a definitive purpose behind everything they do. Um, they want, they see themselves as the dominant cultural force in the world. It is no longer uh, Rome versus Greece, Rome versus Persia, Rome versus Egypt, Rome versus uh, the Mesopotamian cultures. All of those cultures have become subject to Rome. Rome has taken over and dominates all of the Mediterranean, North Africa, northern and western Europe, uh, as far east is into what is today Pakistan and India, as far north as Finland and Iceland and Norway, as far uh, north and, and west as Britain and, and what is today France and Saxony and Ireland, there's Roman influence and culture everywhere, basically, in the Western world. And so as such, they rightfully so feel like they dominate culture and that they can bend culture and move culture towards their will. And their will is all about the purpose of art. What is the purpose of art and culture is a question that the Romans answered definitively, that art and culture should be about the glory and greatness of Rome and the glory and greatness of the emperor and the glory and greatness of Roman people as a whole um, and individuals when those individuals deserve that glory and greatness, whether when they earn it through their service to Rome and through their their uh, individual f achievements, so the purpose is always the glory and the glory and greatness of Rome. But that doesn't mean that it's always about the individual. Uh, many of the Roman emperors put their efforts into making the lives better for all Romans, and that's what made the Roman Empire so different. It is in what we see in, in Egypt, what we see in uh, Mesopotamia, what we see in the Aegean, what we see even somewhat in the Etruscans is this desire for the top level of aristocracy and nobility to enjoy the wealth of the, of the culture. For the Romans, they wanted to extend that to everyone down to the, the lowly slave, down to the, the laborer, the unskilled laborer. If you make their lives better through architecture and building, if you make their lives better through baths, if you make their lives better through generally providing the public works that we expect today, we expect that our, our civic uh, leadership, our, you know, our, mayors and governors and even our president, that they're going to support those fundamental needs 
you know, they're going to give water and roads and they're going to give electricity. And they're going to provide all that for us. Um, and we pay for it, but but they provide it for us. Well, that idea starts with Rome. And we see that. We see what happens as the Roman Empire develops. And this, this uh, graphic here shows the development of the empire. The negative is BCE. And it's as it moves closer and closer to common era, we see it spreading and spreading all throughout Europe and the Mediterranean and northern Europe and wet northwestern Europe. And then slowly but surely, when we move into the common era, it starts to kind of settle out and and the and then ultimately it contracts as it falls. Um, so. We'll go through this one more time so we can see it, you know, that in that at this point, it's really the Republic. And then it's not until here where it starts to be the Empire. Now you see how quickly things spread by that first century common era and into the early second century. There's a great expansion from basically what is today Italy all the way to, you know, to c commanding every part of that touched the Mediterranean. Now, in Rome itself and in other Roman cities, whether the uh, now a Roman city could be anywhere. The Roman city could be in Turkey. Roman city could be in Egypt. Roman city could be in North Africa. Roman city could be in France. Roman city could be in England. Roman city could be in uh, you know in Germany. Um, but in every Roman city, they tend they tended to do some of the same things. This is actually from Ostia, and this is the world's first apartment building. Um, you know, if you're going to have the villas work for the the wealthier part of society, but you need adequate and substantive ho substantive housing for every part of society. You know, you need your workers to have an appropriate and adequate home because that's going to allow them to feel more pride in what they're doing and to feel uh, a part of society, but also just from a you know, logistic standpoint. Uh, if their homes are warmer and drier, they're not going to get sick as often. They're going to be, be able to do more work better, and you know that's what's important. And also they're going to see the possibility of upward mobility, of, of you know, if I work harder, if I learn a new skill or trade, I can perhaps move to a better home. And that's exactly what we see today, right? I want to move to a better home. Well, I need to get a better job so I can make more money if I get a better job. How do I get a better job? Well, I need more skills, okay? So I need to be a skilled laborer or I need to be, you know, I need to make sure that it's through, through my development that I get something out of that. The Greeks were very much about developing the individual, but they didn't see this, you know, that was supposed to be intrinsically developed. So you're just supposed to get to want to be smarter and better so that you serve Greece. Well, Romans are practical, pragmatic people. If I'm going to work hard to get better, I should get something out of it. And, you know, what I should get out of it is a better home, a better life. But initially, even if I'm just a laborer, I should be able to have a, a home. So this is an apartment in Ostia at the Insula. The, these apartment buildings were called Insula. And this Insula, how, or this apartment in this Insula here would have housed uh, a family. Now, probably not an extended family, but perhaps as many as five to nine people would have lived in this small apartment. Um, there was a small hearth for cooking. There was uh, some niches and shelves for storage and for decoration. There was that antechamber for sleeping. Perhaps the children would have slept in this room with maybe the older adults, and then the couple would have stayed in that small little antechamber uh, as their sleeping quarters. Um, now, it doesn't seem like much today, but considering you compare this to the way that People, that the lowest of classes would have lived in other cultures, they would would not have lived as well. They would have had wood mud huts, thatched roofs, would have been cold, no insulation, no water, no heat, no, you know, nothing um, that would have encouraged them to live, that to think that they were living well based upon 
you know, their, their housing. Now, as a worker became more skilled, they would have access to better living quarters, to better insula, to better apartments, to better homes. So, you know, in this insula, they actually have, uh, it, there's, they're larger, first of all. Um, they have windows, as you can see there. They have a small plot of green land uh, around, outdoors and around, so that they could perhaps grow little, you know, uh, herbs and, and perhaps some vegetables uh, to, to, you know, live off of. And the interiors were much better with, you know, stone floors and brick paved floors and lots of interior space, multiple hearths for baking and cooking and warmth. I mean, this is, and this is a blacksmith's home. So, you know, we're moving up from the unskilled slave labor, basically, up to a blacksmith. And the blacksmith has skilled labor, which means he earns more money, which means he can afford a nicer home. And nowhere else in the world was the government providing access to this. If you wanted a nicer home, you had it was all through your own wealth and, and labor, you know. But even then, it was very difficult for them to own territory because our own land to build upon because that was all the land was owned by the king or owned by the nobility, the, the landed gentry. Now, in the High Empire, we see some of the most iconic structures of Roman culture ever built. This is the Pantheon, Pantheos, all gods. Unlike the Greeks who built temples and then dedicated them to individual gods, the Romans' belief system was more polytheistic. It allowed for multiple gods, a hierarchy of gods. In fact, in the Roman culture, it, it's because they were there were so many cultures represented in the Roman Empire, they had to allow for uh, worship of whatever god you chose, basically, um, as long as they didn't care which which god you worshipped, but they did care that your first commitment was always to Rome. In fact, the Roman Empire, part, part, being a part of the Roman Empire, came with a lot of rights and responsibilities and came with a lot of privileges as well, including worshipping your god inside a temple like this one. So this is in Rome. This is the Pantheon of Rome, but they built temples everywhere, and, and most of those temples were never dedicated to an individual god. So any god could be worshipped. If you wanted to worship your god, you could place an icon of that god, or you could enter that temple and worship in there. It was open to all. This building is one of the most remarkable feats of engineering in the history of the world. It is built primarily from concrete, it is a dome capped uh, rotunda. So it is uh, basically a cylinder capped by a dome. And then the front is a Greek temple front um, that extends out from that rotunda. Um, and when you look at the interior of the rotunda, what's remarkable about it is the dimensions are meticulously thought out and, and planned. Um, the sphere of the dome, the, the half sphere of the dome, fits perfectly onto the cylinder of the rotunda. Uh, and the coffered ceiling is concrete. It's poured cast concrete, but it's an amazing structure. They used the coffering, which is the ribbing and the, the square insets, to uh, allow it to be lighter, allow it to be more structurally stable and sound. Um, but it's a really remarkable structure in the way that it's engineered and the way that they thought about how to um, make such a large and impressive structure um, and make it basically geometrically perfect um, in scale and proportion. So the bottom parts of the rotunda are actually uh, the concrete has been and brick has been covered with marble. The floor is tiled with marble, um, and there, there's an opening in the ceiling. There's the oculus, the eye, which uh, allows light and you know air in and out, and it allows 
rain and water in and out. But it, it the point is, is that the way that it's engineered is is makes it a very beautiful structure, makes it a very interesting and amazing structure, but it has also had tremendous longevity. I mean, this building is almost 2,000 years old, and it is remarkably well-built and preserved. Now, not all Roman buildings suffered the same fate, but they all, all Roman buildings from the empire especially show an amazing level of engineering. The Romans were great engineers. You know, if... If you wanted to, if you were looking for a philosopher or a pure scientist, you'd go to Greece. The Greeks cornered the market on philosophy and, and theoretical science. But if you're looking for an engineer or a practical scientist or some a practical mathematician, you go to Rome. These are the people who built the things that the Greeks dreamed up. These are the people that were able to uh, apply what the Greeks had learned scientifically, and to use that in to make life in the world better. And what's remarkable about their feats of engineering is that how how thoughtful they really were. You know, this building is basically just a really large arena, but because of the nature of society and life, um, and what how the world works, uh, they they really did have to think about, okay, well, what if there's the need to, what if there's a fire? What if there's the need to evacuate the building quickly? And so they had to come up with a system to get everybody out, 40,000 people, uh, and they decided that eight to 10 minutes, that 40,000 people would need to exit the building and eight to 10 minutes would be a safe number. So what they did was they created this amazing system that it's missing on this side, but you see evidence of it here. Amazing system of tunnels and passages and ramps so that all areas, all of the seating areas could be, could exit, the people in those areas could exit um, and they didn't trample each other. They're not going out a single exit. They're going out multiple, multiple ramps and exits, um, which made traffic flow and patterns uh, so much more successful. Now, the Romans are great builders with brick. Stone is practical, it, but it's, it's very time-consuming. Concrete is very practical, but it takes a higher level of skill um, to build with concrete, than it, and, and you have to have all the elements and mix them all, all very well in perfect proportions. Um, but brick, brick is, is cheaper, it's easy to mass produce, uh, it's very sturdy and durable. And so when you combine brick and concrete, you basically have the perfect building materials for, from the Roman point of view. Now, the building that you see here is, is, of course, in ruin. But we think at one point that they had a wooden floor, like you see here, that covered the whole floor of the arena. Then uh, probably about a foot of sand above that. And the, the wooden floor would have been tarred. Uh, the arena could be flooded up to the first level for to reenact naval battles. Um, they had great gladiatorial combats. They had exotic animals that they saw, that they watched fight each other. The animals fought men. The animals just... <laughs> You know, trampled and gored people, you know, obviously slaves and Christians, but, you know, every kind of sport and game and activity that especially involved death would have gone on here. Uh, it was a remarkable, remarkable building. And and um, it it really was the, the heart of the city, the the um, the Colosseum was this grand spectacle. It was sort of a combination of, of sporting event and battle and fight and, um, and circus and public display. It was really an amazing, amazing building uh, when it was at its height. Now, like other parts of the empire, parts of the culture, uh, it was also, you know, you don't just build it everywhere else. You build it in Rome, too. And there's in every, uh, or every emperor built a, a monument to themselves uh, in Rome to add to the mystique and add to the glory of Rome. This is the Column of Trajan. It's uh, about 120 feet tall, a little over that. 
and the column itself is has, is covered in relief carvings from top to bottom that spiral from the top to the bottom, and it tells the story of Trajan's armies and the the empire, um, but Trajan's leading the armies in the defeat of the Gauls. Now, the Gauls were a people who had been kind of a thorn in the side of the Romans for years. Um, they lived mostly in Spain and southern France um, and in what is today Portugal. And they had been, they, the Romans had found it very difficult to defeat the Gauls because of the Alps, because of the Swiss uh, and French Alps and the Pyrenees Mountains and how they limited access that, that you had to go through St. Bernard Pass. You had to go through uh, basically this one valley in order to get to um, to that region from Italy. And so the army and troops were, you know, had struggled to get through the valley. They created this natural bottleneck um, and, and they couldn't, um, they struggled to defeat the Gauls. It wasn't until Trajan decided to take his army on ships and sail around to the north and outflank the Gauls um, and and the, the relief carving on the side here tells the story of that in detail. Now, these are the baths of Diocletian. The baths were an amazing structure. Yeah, all of these things were these monumental structures built in and around Rome and in other major cities so that the people's lives would be better. But it's a propaganda message. You know, I'm going to build these great baths, but it's also about uh, hygiene and you know, bathing and, and health, you know, you go to the bath to, to wash and clean, but also to exercise, and, and it becomes a social gathering place, and it becomes sort of a, a part of society, an expectation of society. In the baths, they, they, Romans believed that there was great uh, value in going from hot water to cold water to hot water to cold water and various levels. Um, so you might, you would enter first, uh, your first trip would be into the caldarium, which would be this boiling hot or very, very hot water. And then you'd go from there into the tepidarium, which is more like a kind of a luke, lukewarm. It wasn't quite the, quite cold, but you'd go from really, really hot to kind of cool. And then you would move into the frigidarium, the very, very cold water. And they would get that water cold. They'd engineered all this. They would pump it below ground to a depth of about 80 feet through pipes. And when it came back up, it was cooled down to about 55 degrees because the, the pipes had gone through the, you know, the ground where it was much, much colder you know, below ground like that. Um, so even in summertime, the water in there would be cold. Um, the pools like number four there, the Natatio, that's basically like a large swimming pool. And they did swim for both pleasure and exercise. Um, and all of this, the, everything in this, uh, in this bath, this great bath complex, was open to the public to use. This wasn't just for the wealthy. This was for everyone. It was, and that's, you know, that was part of the rights of being a citizen. Now, this structure is, uh, is it, is important because it's a law court. It's called the Basilica. It will eventually, after the time of Constantine, all of the basilicas will be transformed into the first Christian churches. But at this point, the basilicas were the law courts. These were where the governors would sit in, uh, to rule over a territory uh, or a region. And so there wasn't a basilica in every city, but there was something similar to it because every city had uh, every important city would have a, a governor a ruler of some sort and on the interior this looks very much like a christian church to us because all christian churches were modeled after these original basilicas after the transformation of the roman empire from uh, the empire into the the church now the governor would sit at uh, up at the front in the apse, uh, elevated up on a, a platform on his throne. And if at all, this area out here where today this is a Christian church out here where the congregation sits, um, that would have all been desks of scribes and low-level bureaucrats doing the business and workings of the empire. 
And so this is where the governor would sit to decide disputes and battles and make plans for uh, for the territory and and make the laws that were uh, that, you know over the people he was governing. Sculpture of the high classical uh, in or of the, the empire, I mean, uh, is is again that propaganda message. This is Marcus Aurelius, and it's the largest and most elaborate equestrian portrait. Aurelius was very fond of the equestrian portraits because he was a cavalier, a cavalry, a horse cavalry leader, and because he was kind of short. So putting him on horseback made him seem taller and more impressive. Um, he the the car, the uh, casting here, this cast in bronze, is extraordinarily detailed and high level. The by this point, the techniques have have expanded and been developed over centuries to the to a very very high level of realism in this casting. Um, this is a slightly larger than life size equestrian portrait. It's a monumental casting. To cast something like this takes a tremendous level of skill because uh, you know casting is a, a tricky process at best, but to do it to do such a large object and to do it without breakage and without cracking is uh, really shows a really, really high level of skill. This is the bust of the colossal port statue of Constantine. Now we're going to talk more about Constantine in late antiquity when we move there in the next unit, but Constantine is, um, he is the transition emperor. He's the beginning of the fall of the empire. And he, in the early fourth century, um, the empire didn't last, you know, as long as some of the other cultures that we've looked at. Uh, as an empire, it's, you know, it's begun. The Republic lasts for 500 years before Julius Caesar, before Augustus. But the, the, the empire under Caesar's, only lasts from the time of Augustus through the tail end of the fourth century. After that, it, it breaks apart first in half into the two pieces, and we'll look at the Romantic versus the Byzantine, or the Latin versus the Byzantine, and then it ultimately collapses completely, and we'll talk about that in the next unit. But Constantine is an interesting figure because as an emperor, he's not very successful uh, other than his... Um, he, he made some really, really important decisions about transforming the empire to Christianity. But as an emperor, he is typical of the late second and third century and in, into the fourth century empire. Um, these emperors had gotten progressively more interested in their own ego and in creating you know, images and, and monuments to themselves rather than to support of the empire. So it became all of those important works and public buildings were from the first part of the empire. And then over time, it became less and less about building up the empire, more and more about the glory of the emperor. And Constantine is a perfect example and kind of the culmination of that. This bust, which stands, the bust alone stands uh, about eight feet tall, was at one point part of a colossal statue to Constantine that is uh, everything but the head is gone, but uh, it stood at least 50 feet tall and was this massive monument and F, uh, edifice to himself. And that's the kind of thing that early emperors would never have done because bringing glory to themselves was seen as not, not as important as glory to Rome and glory to the role of Caesar, because that that meant that all of that would have a life beyond them. But by the time of Constantine, it had kind of been corrupted and deteriorated into being just about themselves. Now, the I think the important most important element that I want you to remember about Roman art is that they were open to outside those outside influences that everything good could and be part of Rome um, and that Roman culture is is really more about the the messages and that it sends um, and about developing the people as a society more so than it is about the individual all right so 
we've done Etruscan, we've done Roman, we'll be moving on to late antiquity, and uh, I hope you have uh, learned a lot from this video.